Hello. Welcome to the Nelson University Center Sampler. As a child, I remember the word sampler in two ways. One was to do handiwork while on a train so we wouldn't run back and forth to the water tank. But the more important and meaningful was the sampler was a box that arrived at very important occasions. It was a box of chocolates. And at the top of the box, when you opened it, there was a map that showed you what kinds of chocolates were where. Well, Nelson University Center would like to provide you with a sampling of the courses that we offer. Some are introductory courses, and some are upper division level courses. One is in English, one is in history, another in fine arts, and finally, one in our women's ser studies series. The first of our samplers is in American literature. This is an upper division course, and the students in this course have spent a full year studying American literature. And this is the final part of their course. It's taught by Dr. Marvin Singleton, who has his PhD from Duke University and a PhD in law from the University of Berkeley. I hope you will enjoy our sampling. So this is English 303, the second term. I'm giving out some material here. This is an O'Neill um, excerpt that may interest you in, and we did the Iceman Thomas last time, and this is information about his involvement in Baker's drama course, which was held at Yale, and some of their memories of him. The other block of material is about the James family, and you have one James short story. And this, I think, gives you a very good perspective on that particular family, which the last time we did James involved his story, the um, So that gives you a sense of his background, and it's quite unique as an American uh, pattern. From that same time period, you recall after the Civil War, the Gilded Age, and it was Mark Twain you were reading about. And we started off with that, and I said I would bring, and I have here, the first edition of the Gilded Age. And it shows Mark Twain, it has those illustrations in it, it shows uh, people doing comical things. This is Mark Twain, whom we read last term, but who chronologically, this came out in 1877, shows the um, importance of business to the writing in the United States. These are business people. They're often involved in schemes. Sometimes these are ridiculed. Here's Mark Twain ridiculing on a kind of drawn basis some inventions and activity. Um, he spoofed that even though he himself was pulled into it and as we know from his story, lost lots of money on a type setting machine. So that was the vivid aspect of um, writing in America and it was mostly vivid to the Europeans who looked at at that particular world. And that's relevant for today because we're reading or discussing a chapter of a book called Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis, and it too involves a businessman, in this case a realtor, George F. Babbitt. And that book came out in 1922, and I have a first edition of it too. This is where it came out. And you have the third chapter, is that right? Yes. Uh, that you've prepared for today, and they've selected it. It shows a bit how things date, that you're given only the third chapter. Uh, when I was t first reading American literature, they read the, the whole book. And in 1922, if you talk to your great-grandparents, they might recall the impact of that. The word was thrown around a lot, Babbitts, Babbitry, people who were Rotarians or, or often in fraternal organizations were called Babbitts because they were conformists. They were very standardized kinds of people. Uh, they were not creative and they dwelt 
in, in, in cities. They were an urban type. So Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis is another businessman. I also um, found the Nobel Prize acceptance speech of Sinclair Lewis. And I think if we look at that, even before we discuss Babbitt, we can see some tie-ins. He has to talk about businessmen as subject matter uh, because the people who gave the Nobel Prize were keenly aware of that aspect of America. You can sense in them picking Sinclair Lewis that they must have been a little uneasy for not having given it to Mark Twain because Sinclair Lewis came on as a humorist and as a satirist. A little bit in tone like the nor illustrator Norman Rockwell whose covers for the Saturday Evening Post lots of people are remembered. And in his acceptance speech, as we see it, we'll see that Sinclair Lewis um, was aware that he was given the Nobel Prize as the first American Does everyone have a yes. copy here? No, I don't have the other one. Okay. I have that one, not the other one. Okay, this one. This one is not connected. Do you have a copy, David? American Fear of Literature. Okay, it's it's titled The American Fear of Literature, but that's an artificial title. Uh, this was given December 12, 1930, and it's noted that he was the first American to receive the Nobel Prize. He had earlier in the 20s gained quite a bit of fame or notoriety, depending on your point of view, for having rejected the Pulitzer Prize for literature. The Pulitzer Prize was given at the time his Aerosmith came out. That's about 1926, and that had been a bestseller. Uh, it was a novel about a a doctor, a physician in a, in a smaller city in the United States. And this was seen as a, a more serious novel, a little bit less satiric. It's satire a little bit more considered than that in Babbitt and won the Pulitzer Prize. In rejecting it, and I believe I have in this material his letter explaining publicly why he rejected the Pulitzer Prize. And you can see from his formulation of that that the Pulitzer Prize, from his point of view, letter to the Pulitzer Prize committee, that he obviously felt that he might be condoning the American Academy of Arts and Letters the National Institute of Arts and Letters, and a few other organizations which he considered very genteel and manipulative. That begins to bring us to the heart of, of Babbitt, the book, and to the heart of the 20s, of why they were roaring, what constituted all of the roar, and why at the end of the century, that particular decade, and we're going to read F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, for next week, why that particular decade is possibly the most creative and impressive of all of American literature. If we, we look in at the <clears throat> address to the Nobel Prize Committee, we look at the names that he mulls over as to who he really thinks might have received the award. He's very humble in this, and he polished, polished it up quite well. He, in fact, seems so stiff in his tuxedo and his formalism that everyone wondered if his mother had been English. He was incredibly up for this, and he really polished it. Because normally Red Lewis, as he was known, was, was a bit of a, a lanky clown. And he was very red 
his hair was red. Here's an anthology of his works, and there you have it. He, um, he went to Yale College from the Midwest and was there from about 1906, 1907. Uh, that was uh, an interesting social experience. Yale College was exclusive at that time. And then he took off, a bit of a free spirit, spent a couple of years knocking about in, in ships and spending time in, in California in Carmel area and generally getting some experience of life, imitating, I suppose, a little bit uh, people like Upton Sinclair, imitating uh, people like Jack London. Uh, that was part of growing up. And then he went back to Yale College, uh, completed his degree, and graduated with a class of probably 1907-1908. I can recall that. He started his career, and we have some excerpts of that with the Yale Literary Magazine. He, he wasn't, though, one of the kind of collegians in the sense that F. Scott Fitzgerald was. He, was. he felt himself a little bit the outsider, and that works through all of his works. It shows that he's, it put him on edge. When we look at his earliest writings, we see him somewhat uh, tense culturally, and that of course sets him up to be an effective satirist. I have another book here, The Man Who Coolidge. Coolidge was a very um, popular president, just as Ronald Reagan was a popular president within our memory. The man who knew Coolidge is subtitled Being the Soul of Lowell Schmaltz, Constructive and Nordic Citizen. And this came out, 1928, this is another first edition, right at the peak, right at the peak of the boom. This is before the Depression of 1929. This is when Coolidge was almost idolized by the Americans. Again, with very, very high levels of popularity. He was a Republican president, and so he appeared to be an administration or a businessman's president. Very conservative, very much addressed to small town USA. The man who knew Coolidge, this Lowell Smaltz, just turns it on. This is all dramatic monologue and just pours it out. And he is he is a complete fool. He's, he's, he's obviously uh, not only a fool, but really somewhat unattractive in, in some of his uh, thinking and his politics. Later on, Sinclair Lewis wrote a book, It Can't Happen Here, which is about domestic fascism in the United States, the possibility of a fascistic regime in the United States. So Sinclair Lewis had politics, and they were, we might characterize them as liberal, moderate. Some of his politics are represented in, in one of the letters that's, again, part of my handout for today. And that's shown in his unpublished preface to Babbitt. He himself wrote an introduction. And there's some political aspects to that, as well as an introduction to what you have, your excerpt, and so you can see what he was really thinking about when he put together this particular uh, piece of satire. The third excerpt you have, Seeing Red on Communism, which he published in Newsweek, 1937, uh, indicates that though he was liberal, he was not at all a party liner. He was quite opposed to uh, the Soviet Union's dominance of a certain clique of writing in the United States in the 1930s. Uh, Sinclair Lewis was very supportive of the American involvement in the Second World War and wrote um, quite a bit, uh, some of it journalism, throughout that period. We come back to the American fear of literature, or his address to the Nobel Prize Committee. We see a very high tribute to Theodore Dreiser, and it's obvious that, that he feels that this, what he calls this great grizzly bear, this German-American who wrote books such as Sister Carrie, and um, again about businessmen, the titan the tycoon figures. 
uh, Theodore Dreiser, uh, he, he feels that Sinclair Lewis feels, uh, opened things up and made it possible for the lighter weight writers, I could say that stylistically too, such as Sinclair Lewis, to exist and to be able to write some kind of satire against that American empire that had apparently become so standardized, so much involved in advertising, so much alike. In his unpublished introduction to Babbitt, which uh, at your leisure you can read, you can <coughs> see that an important thing to Sinclair Lewis was that if you drove across the United States, any city above, say, 5,000 in population was absolutely indistinguishable from any other city. They all had the standard oil station. They all had such and such. It's only when you were on the edges of the cities that you could tell whether you were in Albuquerque or you were in uh, Spokane. And he was struck by the fact that the United States was no longer uh, a, an agricultural country, its population by 1920 had ceased to be predominantly farm and had become largely urban. And he wished literature to reflect that. So Babbitt is, is a very city, suburban kind of reality. Um, at about that time, there were actually sociological books coming out and kind of profiling typical cities, Middletown, uh, other books of that sort. So that was the exciting discovery uh, that Babbitt tried to reflect. We have not only Dreiser mentioned in here, but H.L. Mencken. H.L. Uh, Mencken also had a role to play in cutting away the underbrush and allowing people like Sinclair Lewis to work with their particular topic. Lewis was interested in surfaces and cities. Uh, some of this shows in certain American paintings from this period. The Hopper's Night Visitors, it's kind of a stark diner painting. Uh, don't have a copy of that with me. But the surfaces that Sinclair Lewis picks up, you'll sense a bit in The Great Gatsby also. You'll see the great fascination for the um, almost neon qualities, almost realism that, that, that was there. This particular um, reality, Mencken fed into the serious writers uh, largely in his American Mercury, and I have some copies of that here. Again, your great-grandparents might re recall this particular uh, journal. It was supported fairly strongly in, in Canada, and it had in it a feature. If you turn to the inside part, you'll see some clippings from it, little clippings called the Americana items. In every issue were Americana items. And out of those items, you can see the way in which a world like Babbitt was distilled and made available to someone like Sinclair Lewis. The Americana items are clippings of absurdities, often with little sarcastic introductions, and they're, they are clippings. They're verbatim uh, clippings drawn from well, the Legionnaire magazine, the Rotary magazine, um, hundreds of periodicals, local papers, uh, such things as Edgar Lee Masters or Sherwood Anderson or anyone might have clipped and wanted to send in to him. And they were also headed from the state of origin. Mencken, among other editorial functions in his Mercury, collected those and to read them is like eating salted peanuts. I mean, you can't stop, and they're really quite hilarious. Some of them are rather tragic, even, but many of them are are uh, hilarious. <laughs> no I see that Barbara. Is, uh, Can I read this? 
<laughs> yes, you can read them. We can start um, throwing them around. This is from California. California complaint filed with Chief of Police R. Lee Heath of Los Angeles by Mrs. Angelino Inforacto. Um, I wish to report that Officer Raider some time ago choked my dog so bad that he scared my child so bad that he immediately infantiled, par paral paralyzed, and was quarantined for two weeks. And then it just goes on. <laughs> well, I, have, I have my favorites. I read one of these in the um, Women's Studies course. Uh, Progress of the New Morality in Jersey City. That's Jersey City, New Jersey. Frank Haig's area. Mrs. Mary Greco was found guilty of violating the Vice and Immor Immorality Act by Acting Judge McGovern, Second Criminal Court. Mrs. Greco early Sunday erected a clothes pole in her backyard. Now, he, he would pick up on what you might call Victorianism or blue laws or any type of activity which appeared to be moralistic. Mencken's contribution to these writers such as Sinclair Lewis was that Mencken was opposed to legislative morality. Mencken's views were that these urban uh, gentlemen were above the need to be told by a group of populist demagogues whether they should drink liquor or not. Mencken was opposed to prohibition which had been enacted in 1919 as an actual amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Here's Mencken doing his editorial labors in the Mercury. We can well imagine him combing through these clippings. And the effect of these clippings, and we're now talking 15 years, was to lift the Americans into greater self-consciousness so they were a little bit less bourgeoisie, a little bit less dopey than he'd found them. So he did educate them up. Some of the middle Americans actually shot back at him. The Saturday Evening Post had a, uh, a section which they gathered up of clippings of Menkenites doing somewhat silly things. And so they shot back and forth at each other. Obviously the circulation of the Saturday Evening Post was many times that of the Mercury, but in any case there was a cultural fight there. Literature couldn't help but benefit from this kind of turbulence. And one of the greatest things of the 20s was their ability to satirize the American cultural uh, foibles and imperialisms. These forms of satire could be relatively good-natured, as were those of Sinclair Lewis who is sometimes said to have written what you might call strongly worded valentines to his countrymen. Um, or they could be blunt, juvenilian, I'd say, more like that of Mencken, who, who, who could be quite scathing to, to fundamentalists in particular, or people who were trying to part him from his German beer. Very uh, strongly that way. You recall from E. E. Cummings some of his poems uh, in the 20s were um, opposed to ticky-tacky, kind of normative America, very uneasy with that, and, and much more celebrative of romanticism in his case. Um, in the case of Mencken, um, a celebrative of, of science and well, the old world culture, in his case the German-American culture of Baltimore. In the case of Sinclair Lewis, he held up to it, a fairly widespread uh, liberal sense of decencies. Uh, not difficult to characterize him as a fairly mainstream uh, member of the Democratic Party. He himself always tried to write a strike novel. Never really got it written, but um, it's interesting of his politics. If you look through his unpublished materials, you'll see that he came awfully close to writing a novel about a Gastonia, North Carolina strike. And uh, he, he wrote about it a lot. And of course, that would be fatal to, to a novel. You, you write it out. You do everything except write it. You, know, you get wonderful uh, conversations going in respect to that. While I'm handing these things out, here are some uh, reminders relevant, I think, more to O'Neill, 
and that is the Little Theater Movement. These came out in the 1920s, and they show the excitement of some of these things that uh, Eugene O'Neill uh, was active in in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Tremendously exciting decade. If you want to read up on it, uh, your best single book uh, is, I suppose, Frederick Hoffman's The Twenties, which I think some of you were looking at or, or Beverly has there. Yes. Um, Fred Hoffman overviews it uh, quite well. And uh, there are other background uh, books in respect to that or some of the, the tendencies that we have. Uh, I have some material on Mencken, if anyone uh, wants to read him. I think it's been found that he <clears throat> he is not at this time politically correct. And uh, we mentioned that the anthologies that we have no longer reprint his attacks on Puritanism. They no, no longer tend to feature his attacks on, on the more uh, stodgy, uh, what he called new humanists, um, idealists. Actually, he called them idolists. If you hear him speak it, he didn't go for idealism. He wanted his beer. Uh, he wanted his science, and he didn't really want uh, some kind of uplift or some kind of neo-Victorianism or some kind of Longfellow-like Anglo-Saxon um, posturing. The reason he was so short with the American gentility and in Lewis's um, Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Lewis attacks William Dean Howells, who along with Henry James, was, um, and as well as Mark Twain, were again writing about business people. Uh, he attacks William Dean Howells because his realism was genteel realism. And that wasn't quite strong enough for Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis, by that time, had before him the example of Upton Sinclair, uh, who's very um, uh, tough, reformist, progressivist, jungle book, uh, was responsible for the passing of the Pure Food and Drug Act in its attack on meatpacking abuses and that industry in the Chicago area. So, so poor William Dean Howells, for whom I have high regard, was uh, being used in the Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1931 as the very figure of a, of a, a vapid, nerdy, nerdy type of uh, uh, diluted, wan-faced, pale-faced uh, pseudo-realist. Not quite fair, but that shows uh, what the uh, taste was you know, in the 20s. Let's look at Babbitt itself. You have the third chapter, and that's well chosen. Um, that's called George F. Babbitt and the Fairy Girl. Um, and we have made immortal what it sounds like to try to get a Ford to run, at least back in 1922. I'm sure they, they run better now. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> he used ether, a can of ether, to get his going when it was bad. That's, of course probably no longer used. Well, they have liquid fire now. Liquid fire. It's real fine. Yeah. Which is still eating. Well, I don't know what it is. You just squirt it in the carburetor and run like hell and turn the key and <laughs> give it some gas and it'll explode. It and it works, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Babbitt, what is, what, is, what is his world about? Is he well adjusted to it? Does he fit in? Is he conformist? I suppose in a sense we could ask, is he a Babbitt? Is he really a Babbitt? Or does he have his own rebellion? Do we see anything, any fire in the coals here? Well, he sounds like he's not too sure about his, the doppelbrows. Well, this is, he, but, this is but, part but of I think there's part of it he I really think he's kind of he's just as attracted he's he's nosy and there's an attraction to their lifestyle that's quite out of out of proportion to his expressed distaste for their lifestyle this yes lurking in every Babbitt is is a bohemian and and that's certainly true of George F Babbitt he, he so he mouths certain levels of things he, he, as Prufrock does, he prepares a face to meet the faces he will meet, and we see him 
meeting Dr. Littlefield here in a few moments. And so when he attacks the Doppelbraus, what would be their ethnic background? European, probably German or German. something like that. What would that mean Sweet. possibly in Canada as well? What would that have meant in the United States in 1922? Well, firstly, they might have been drinking beer or something. I suppose it'd be like Mencken. Mencken was a present example of that. He couldn't believe that good Pilsner beer would somehow be outlawed by, by these idealists. Quite apart from the fact that they're probably like fourth generation American anyway, it's just their mm -hmm. last name. There'd still be that double take, um, knee jerk response to the name that it sounds German and you sort of give them a real suspicious look. Yeah, the foreign foreignness yeah. about it, and certainly this this I suppose in Canada would be that in Winnipeg, if you were from the Ukraine, Ukrainian community would be under pressure in respect of your name, or there'd be sociological impact and sorting out. Uh, in 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 the states, this I suppose the names of the radicals, the the people behind the new masses or the the masses uh, who were on Manhattan Island and were, were being anarchists. They would also have German or German-Jewish names. And so these people out in the hinterland, uh, out in, in, in this kind of sort of idealized city of Zenith, which we think of as a very Midwestern kind of city, um, they, you'd be suspect just because you had a foreign-looking name. And so that's, that's what we have. That's fairly superficial, but that's a superficial response. And his day is being put together out of these little superficial responses. But we do sense there's more to him than that. There, there's almost lurking within him. Uh, one thinks of Flaubert's Madame Bovary, where lurking within Madame Bovary is, who would be simply a housewife, a provincial French housewife, would be the capacity for, for rebellion, for, for passion. And so he's dreaming of something called the fairy girl. How does that hold up? He's a daydreamer then. Mm -hmm. So where's that going to get him? Can we tell from chapter three? I don't think it'll get him anywhere. I, I think he may have dreams of going somewhere with it, but I think it would be too much of a, of a front to his, his desire to fit in the respect that he perceives that other people have for him. And all of that would be much, much too much to give up for a flight of fantasy. I think he's a middle-aged man who suddenly realizes life is slipping and he hasn't had his fair share and he's, he's a little regretful. But doesn't, in the book, doesn't he have an affair? I know he almost brings his whole life crashing down on him, but I read the book a million years ago and I, I don't remember now. Well, he has, uh, he, he's, he's going to have trouble with it. He, yes, he does. He, he does find, he finds a kind of uh, bohemian girl. And some, it, it doesn't work out particularly well. He has trouble crossing over. He, he, what I think you're describing is sometimes called ego. His ego is embedded in this mosaic of contacts, such as um, Professor Littlefield mm -hmm. here. And so you piece yourself together, and then it's just too much to make it to, to, to crash out of it. So he's, he's caught in a conventional world, and his, his nose is against the window, and, and he's trying to get out of it. And when he does, it ends up being an opportunity for some chapters satirizing the kind of alternate culture that would exist in a city like Zenith. And, and there's some, so, so Sinclair Lewis is able to take the measure of that. And so it's fairly pathetic, a lot of typing on both sides and, and not, not many characters who we would think of as well-rounded or capable of negotiating a, a grand rebellion. Uh, but that indeed may be the value of Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis is, is targeting, is, is identifying, I think, what real people tend to be up against. They, they do come up against these, these constraints. Um, and that's, that's part of realism uh, working there too. Yeah, because this, this whole, all of this kind of writing is completely at odds with what was appearing in the women's magazines of the day, and women's novels. I mean, just total sort of 
fairy tale existence, you know, like he's right. like, in Babbitt or in no, the, in, the in, no, but like I mean, here's here's Sinclair Lewis writing the man's side of it, and which was probably realistic. I mean, you know, in terms of you know having affairs and and what they're thinking of and all that kind of stuff. But it's completely at odds with the life that Mrs. Babbitt would be reading in her novels and her ladies' magazines mm. and this terrible gentility and... Where everything is wonderful. And oh yeah, and perfect, and your husband There's is... There's no absolute. doppelmeyers in it. Oh, I, yeah. Doppel Doppelgangers. <laughs> this is... I don't know if any of you ever saw the comic strip of Maggie and Jigs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, actually this, this particular novel operates pretty closely to that level. And Maggie and Jiggs, as a comic strip, was based, the cartoonist himself had been married to someone very like Maggie, and she spent 60 years suing him to get him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so we are definitely talking about Denty Morris. I mean, we, what is that, uh, you, um, uh, W.C. Fields? And you're beginning to move into territory that Philip Wiley talked about, the American mom. You're beginning to talk about men, women, relationships. And that's interesting because last term we looked at Love and Death in the American Novel, his, his, his thesis, that there really aren't any mature man-woman contexts coming out of, of American literature in the 19th century. Very, very few of them. And those that are there, such as in Scarlet Letter, uh, um, are under a tremendous amount of apparent stress. Very, very difficult. So the Europeans were noting that. And possibly they were broken, at least Sinclair Lewis, you know, has some of these relationships. They're difficult relationships, and that's what happens. It's, I think you can predict from chapter three it's not going to work that well. But uh, we're but back. He thinks it was in the conventional, too. I mean, he's a conventional guy, the all-American fellow, and he flirts like, like it's a conventional thing to do, right? I mean, he's not crossing any boundaries when he starts flirting and admitting that he looked at every ankle that ever went his way. You know, you don't feel like he's a sleaze when he says that. You just figure, no. well, that's... You know, but if you said that about Doppelbrau, then you pro then he probably would be a dirty old man. You, you yeah, get that. yeah, you get that selectivity. Yeah. You know, I'm no fool. Um, you have an insecurity system. Doppelbrau is paranoid. You know, you get into these kind of regresses. <laughs> does anybody speak German? What does Doppelbrau mean? Doppelbrau would be. Does Brau mean double, beer? Does it mean double, double beer? Yeah, double well, beer. Brau, yeah. Yeah, Maybe that is sinister, actually. <laughs> Double brood. <laughs> some some <laughs> tip is lurking in that. Oh, actually. You never know how well, to do coconut. It's wild music that, that he imagines coming from his Impossible the And um, partying. Hellraising. Yeah. So, go ahead. What is Sinclair's angle in, in respect to the fact that uh, this conventionality or this conformism, is it something that Babbitt is, is, is self imposed? Is it something that he's born into? The book isn't isn't philosophic in, in that regard. Uh, Dreiser's books coming out at the same time. We have an American tragedy that came out about 1925. It'd be three years after. Um, um, were more grimly deterministic. They, the Europeans, indeed, Lewis must have respected. Uh, Newt, Knut Hampson. Uh, there were there were naturalistic kinds of writers, very Scandinavian, uh, and and ponderous a bit, but but philosophical, and and St. Carlos is not philosophical. He doesn't take his determinism and his mingle it in with his realism. His realism is that of surfaces. He catches those surface lights. And he does it fairly well, and there's there's a, a kind of profundity of surfaces, too. I, I don't myself put that down. Uh, he's a bit uneasy in his Nobel Prize speech uh, at the fact that he's his style, he's not quite as fine a stylist as, as Henry James. He, he may be a little bit uneasy about uh, his relationship to, to novel structure compared even with, with uh, such a writer as, as William Dean Howells, but, but his ability to pick up those surfaces that we see in chapter three and, and work with those kinds of qualities of surface that Mencken put across his desk every month in, in this particular periodical. This periodical was read by the American uh, elite, and at least up until the, th the 30s, it, it certainly set the tone. Here's an American composer composing as Randall Thompson, a rather major American writer of music, a sequence of five transcripts from Americana set to chorus of mixed voices 
Well, he found it sufficiently hilarious that he would simply set it to, to music. So it, it's, it's widespread. If you ever want to read up on that, uh, I can run off any amount of that material. Uh, I, think, I think they have a kind of profundity, and I take seriously this kind of satire, because whether it's Juvenalian or Horatian or Menopean or whatever kind of satire it is, a culture's health is directly functional, and that's true in literature as well, to its ability to put deadness to rest. And that's what the satirist does. He has an important scavenging function. And if you don't have people like Lewis, and you don't have people like Mencken, uh, things become bad. They, they, they commence to go bad in, in a culture. So if, if everyone is genteel and everyone is being very nice at all times, or as Mencken once worded it, so coo and snivel the sweetness, so wags the national tongue. He, he could be quite scathing. Mencken was very blunt. You know, he take the folly or absurdity like a grape, put it on the anvil and sort of pop it with his hammer. I mean, he, he enjoyed that. It wasn't terribly subtle, certainly he was a person of prejudices, and that's what he called his essays, prejudices. And they came out. Recently uh, it's been discovered that he was a person who had prejudices, and there was great astonishment at that. I think his own phrase, he announced the obvious in terms of the scandalous. So who's going to tell me that Mencken has prejudices? I know he has prejudices. That's why everyone read him. Here's another book. This is an August 1925 book, and this would be and was contributed to more by Sinclair Lewis than was the American Mercury. The, um, it has Porgy in it, a story by Du Bois Hayward, and uh, a few other kinds of writers. It's another magazine, a little bit more moderate, sort of midway between the Mercury and the Atlantic or Harper's um, as a, a monthly. So those were the... Now as satire, we look again at your particular excerpt. Uh, we have the PhD from Yale in economics. Now, I mentioned that, that Sinclair Lewis had gone to Yale as an undergraduate, but was, as I said, uneasy there. He didn't fit into the, some of the success patterns. Um, he made his mark there, certainly worth going back to graduate, but he wasn't one of the senior society's clients. By his choice or theirs? By theirs. Uh, I'm sure, but possibly by his. I mean, if he turned down a Pulitzer Prize, he might have also turned down being tapped by skull and bones or whatever those things were. So, basically, let's look at uh, his little field, though. We need to appreciate uh, that. Is his name, uh, does that tell us anything about the, is there something rather E.E. E. Cummings-like about the name Littlefield? I mean, does he come up with great mag cosmic powerful truths about universal life, or is he is he strictly a one-cylinder? What, what would you say about him? Dynamic? No, I think it probably describes him. He's very limited in his scope and his interests and his concerns are. Little fiddles. There's something rather sinister about him, though, because it says he pops up in two minutes. He, he, can, he does know economics sort of to lobby. He can instantly persuade any board or any commission. Yeah, ten hours prep time or something. Yeah, he, he's a hack. He, yeah. he obviously takes his, his knowledgeability about economics, the dismal science, and goes in and, and dumps it uh, any time somebody's trying to break a strike or such a thing as that. So he's uh, obviously, San Carlos, I, I think, doesn't want us to like him. He, he's, he's petty. Uh, he's, he's, his function in Zenith, is, the city of Zenith, is vicious, and he is, he is the kind of kept economist that, that Sinclair Lewis and his circle uh, thought were, were very bad for, for the United States. Um, at, at this same time, I suppose the hero economist for that circle, the Sinclair Lewis circle, would have been Thorsten Veblen. Thorsten Veblen was from the state of Wisconsin, a Norwegian-American family, for whom Norwegian was 
was the main language spoken. And Thorsten Veblen was a very brilliant economist. He started writing books about 1904, and the theory of the leisure class came to be his best known book, but he wrote about handicraft, and he wrote about the theory of business enterprise, he wrote lots of books, and was absolutely uh, harried from pillar to post. He could never get an academic position if he'd be thrown out. He'd be teach, teach briefly somewhere. He was just too eccentric. He was quite brilliant. He certainly knew, he learned about conspicuous consumption and all of the follies that, that, that in fact are in, in Babbitt itself as a book. Uh, these would be theoretically supported and identified by Thorsten Veblen's rather mordant and ironic uh, books, brilliant books, academically a failure. Somebody like Littlefield, though, would always get a position lecturing away, a complete flack, uh, his, yeah. his PhD. So, so that would be the pro and con of, of what was happening in that particular field in the United States. It sounds like he could, he's a real chameleon. He can change his colors to suit. I can just imagine him, you know, switching completely in mains, you know, in midstream. His his conversation, and, if you look at it, is is totally takes the shape of his container. Every one of his rejoinders is. I, I think what Barbara said. If, let's let's just look at that, where he starts that conversation. I mean, it's just awful. He's. Yeah. He watch him. He just he's just flavoring it and handing it right back. That's everything George F. Babbitt says, and George F. Babbitt isn't exactly rocking the boat. So I mean that's not what we'd call I think really good conversation by any definition. So that would be then a little pin portrait, a little foil character, a little reflector character there to help identify the, what's going on in, in, in Zenith. Zenith then takes on a kind of personality and um, it takes on a kind of reality and that, that was popular America too. We, we, we think of in even such now resurrected things as Batman. There's a kind of particular city there, the cities which take on a kind of personality. So, are there any other characters that we meet that are like Littlefield, that are momentary reflectors? Well, you can tell why Babbitt likes Littlefield simply because Littlefield does back. You know, he, yeah. he 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 goes along with whatever Babbitt's saying. That guy he picks up at the bus station or the bus stop. Um, there is something in here. Uh, oh. He says, oh my God. It gets my goat when a fellow gets stuck on himself and goes around tooting his own horn merely because he's charitable, and yet that's. Exactly. <laughs> he's he's pissed off because the, the, the guy he picked up won't you know tell him how thank him and, and yeah. tell him how yeah. wonderful he is. Yeah. He, he wants that stroking, we'd yeah. say. He mm -hmm. he keeps his ego together by that, that kind of stroking pattern. But it, he and, and so he I mean everything he surrounds himself he 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 takes as a direct reflection on himself and from himself. So there's this, you know, the building he's in and and even the guilt he feels about not patronizing the local barbershop in the, the building, but he goes to some palatial uh, place down the street in another hotel, again, simply because that one, in his own mind, has obviously has greater um, prestige, which reflects on his own taste. You know. Conspicuous consumption, yeah, another yeah. form of that. Beblin was on to it. What's interesting is, you were mentioning his rebellion and his, his attempt to break out and, and find was that at the end of that he he definitely is in trouble with with the fraternal organizations uh, toward the end of the book and and if you've read the whole of it you might recall that, that they definitely are beginning to raise eyebrows because he has been seen you know dancing or has been you know out something like that and so he's on the spot there are periods of time when basically George F. Babbitt tells him exactly where to go 
George F. Babbitt is not a complete dork. Uh, so in a sense, the book itself, is, as I asked, indicates that this guy, there's a bit of fire in the ashes. There's more to Babbitt than lots of these people, these little characters like Littlefield. Uh, he gives them a pretty good run. Now eventually he comes back, uh, as we sense that he, he, he will. There's nothing out there quite to sustain his, his walk on the wild side. But, but he, he has some really good speeches in there about telling people um, where to go. So, uh, they're, they're, and that, in a sense, is where the book almost stops becoming a satire and comes alive as a novel. So, in a sense, it's been criticized as a fault within the book. The book is, didn't sustain the tone of the third chapter that you've read, but almost came alive and has this guy beginning to become other than a type. He's be, been given some depth, he's been given some texture and a bit of resolution, but then he drops back uh, from that. So I suppose some of the, the commentators have simply said that uh, Sinclair Lewis was well advised to move to a different kind of book like Aerosmith, which is all novel. It, it keeps its satire quite incidental and, and uh, controls it. In his Man Who Knew Coolidge, the satire predominates 100%, so he surged right back, back into it. Uh, it's easy to Then what is it of why then what exactly is a novel then? I mean The novel is a fictional narrative which is probabilistic but which deep digs deeply into to a, a theory of people's beings such that they don't react so shallowly as Babbitt is set up to do at the outset. We see his ego structure working. It's very precarious. I mean, it's very hand to mouth. I mean, he bumps up against the, the man who's filling his gas tank. It's going to say just the right things. You know, Littlefield has got to say just the right things to keep his day from going bad. And as you just pointed out, he turns against somebody who doesn't, uh, who has some kind of integrity to keep that, to, to, to do other than stroking conversation. And he's disquieted by that. He feels resentment. But underneath that resentment is his own feeling that his life is completely empty. So in that sense, too, he's like Bovary. So, but yeah, From this chapter, we don't. he feels two-dimensional to me. I don't get a yeah. hold of what he's yeah. feeling. Yes. You yep. know, it's just sort of almost a cartoon character. That's in right. In fact, I don't know this Maggie and Jigs or whatever, but I, I thought of Dagwood or, mm. you know, he just sort of kind of blustering along and, you know, but Dagwood's much nicer than Babbitt, I think. It's sort of yeah. a lot funnier, you know, it's so critical of people, but this one was uh, less well, harmless. Yeah. I, I, he seems to be in a position where he could be harmful. Babbitt. Mm -hmm. that, that's, yes, I, I think that kind of ominous, again, spins out of his later books, where uh, to talk about the man in Codes 1928 indicates that St. Critolus was uneasy about drifting along and people not thinking more deeply about things. He wrote something for um, an undergraduate uh, magazine, which I read somewhere, the Yale Literary Magazine, and he was disquieted by what he found in Yale and was the same kind of commentator there. He's saying, you, no one here knows really what we are. You know, that these kinds of little success patterns are quite silly and superficial and they're not getting us anywhere. And so he was consistently himself. Um, a good middle-brow commentator on lots of valuable realities. In that sense, again, a lot like w Howells, whom he criticizes. So, but it's, I mean, his reality is based in people today as well. Um, nothing has changed. There's some psychology operating here, and again, that's an accomplishment. And that's why the book threatens to come alive and as a novel uh, with three dimensions. There is some psychology set going in this. There's some psychology of surfaces, and there are a lot of psycho psychologists who would say, in fact, I recently read a book uh, called uh, by Kaplan called, uh, uh, it, it's based on study of Emma Bovary, that's why I'm thinking of her a fair amount, and it, it simply shows some of these hang-ups, describes them, and he uses that 
kind of fiction, Flaubert's kind of fiction, to as a way to describe the way people are. And uh, there's nothing new about that. Freud did that when he talked about the Oedipus con complex. He went back to literature and, in fact, lots of depth psychologies, lots of psychoanalysis people studying that kind of thing um, indicate to me quickly whether they're getting into it as uh, to the speed with which they reach towards literature to identify what they've broken open. So it's helpful there. Well, that's probably enough uh, at the moment on St. Clair Lewis. Uh, if you read the handout, I think you'll become interested in him. Read the introduction, unpublished to Babbitt, and read his reaction in 1937 to the proletarian writers, so-called, and you'll identify the kinds of integrity which sustained this particular man's satire. I hope you've enjoyed the first of our series in the University Sampler on American literature. Our next in the series will be the history of Renaissance and the Reformation, a time very much like our own time today. <laughs>